Chapter 12 In spite of the difficulties in the spring of 2003, for family reasons, I had to return to Hackney. I took up work at Haggerston School in the south of the borough as an all-purpose permanent supply teacher. By this time, I was aware that at nearly every school at which I'd worked, there had been some major crisis shortly after I'd left. At Westcliff, a teacher had set fire to the school. At Sir John Cass and Redcoat, the children had gone on strike. At William Penn, a murder had taken place. Kingsdale had been attacked by the boys from Tulse Hill. At Camden Grammar School, the roof had collapsed and a catastrophe for some, it was turned into a comprehensive. In Hackney, the schools were just destroyed. Even in Los Angeles, the pupils went on a freedom march for clean toilet. I did warn the head at Hagston about this and told her that these disasters tended to happen after I'd left to school. But she took no notice. She was full of Ed's speak about steep collaborative learning curves, best cross-curricular practice targets, taking mission statements on board and going forward to create project-based real-world pupil-inclusive workspaces. However, just like her predecessor, she had very little idea about money and the management of the school finances had fallen into the hands of Kevin, the business manager. This man, formerly the schoolkeeper, had persuaded both heads that he knew a thing or two about the maintenance of the school. Pretty soon he was controlling the school budget. Kevin liked to take his holidays in Spain, where it was said he was building a nice little place for his mother. She was none too well, you see. One day the business manager disappeared to Spain, so they said. At the same time, purely coincidentally, £1,300,000 also vanished from the school budget. The head had to clear up the mess. First, she got rid of expensive supply teachers like me. I tried to warn her of the consequences, but listening wasn't her strong point. Then, when the full impact of the budget shortfall sunk in, she decided on a complete restructuring of the teaching staff. This meant that six heads of department had to be sacked. These teachers were not only popular with the staff, parents and pupils, they were good. I had supported many of their lessons and was in awe of their skills and their ability to control and inspire without seeming to break sweat. In particular, the head of languages was one of the finest teachers I've ever seen. She would walk into class, click her fingers and have them all singing in French in the time it took to say, Bonjour, madame. Most language teachers in English secondary school suffer from the complete indifference of pupils. Parents and often staff were also largely dismissive of all other cultures and languages. There seemed to be a special prejudice against France and all things French. Yet this French woman, had them in the palm of her hand and they loved her for it. The highlight of the summer term was sports day. The girls would be taken to the East London Stadium where they would scream to their heart's content in support of their houses green, yellow, purple, orange, blue and red. Teachers would cheerfully manage the discus, the relays, the high jump and the javelin. On this occasion, the head of languages was in charge of the long jump, in full view of the entire school. For some reason, the head teacher decided to send a letter sacking the head of languages in the middle of sports day via courier. The missive duly arrived. On discovering her fate, Madame naturally burst into tears in front of 700 semi-hysterical girls. All hell broke loose. From this moment, the school essentially collapsed. 
staff and pupils went on strike. The chair of governors resigned. The head was sacked. The school was closed. Haggerston Girls' School was no more. It was restructured and turned into a mixed academy. It was years before the damage caused by the head teacher and her business adviser was repaired. Strangely, she has been brought back in 2016 as an adviser to the Learning Trust, the body that replaced Hackney Council Education Department. Less strangely, Haggerston was my last school. Given the disasters that seemed to occur whenever I left a school, perhaps I should never have become a teacher in the first place. For people looking for an instant answer to what is wrong with English education, clearly the answer is me. Well, I don't teach in schools anymore, so everything should be just fine. Most teachers must wonder, in their darkest moments, why they chose to be a teacher, especially in a difficult area. To the general strain of teaching very demanding pupils is added the humiliation of being named and shamed, of fingers being pointed by government and press. Your school is failing. You are failing. According to the media, you are bog standard. Your school is bog standard. Your pupils are bog standard. Your whole community is bog standard. You're not a hero for teaching pupils that nobody else wants to teach. You're a fool. A fool for showing loyalty and commitment to the most deprived children in Britain. Get out. Get out now. Your inner voice will tell you, leave the sinking ship and go and teach nice children in a nice area. Or give up teaching altogether. There must be something else you can do. After all, teachers have choice too. Even though most of the pupils do not. I doubt that you are wondering why nobody wants to teach anymore. The subject has been aired a thousand times in the press. We know the answers. Too much paperwork, not enough pay, low status and too much interference and abuse from politicians. I want you to remember, I told the class, that the principal question in the study of history is why. Keep asking yourself why, 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 why. Sir, why did you become a teacher? Asked a sharp voice from the centre of the classroom. Because you're no bloody good. Away from the slings and arrows of outrageous pupils and safe in the teacher's toilet. I pondered the question. Answers. A. Because I love history. B. To offset inequalities in society. C. To make democracy safe for Britain. D. To pass on a great body of knowledge with its concomitant intellectual processes. E. Because I didn't want to be anything else. G. Because I wanted a mortgage. I. Because I couldn't be anything else. J. Because I'm an institution junkie. A recidivist. Back in the staff room, I start marking essays. What were the causes of the Russian Revolution? They don't know. I bet they know the answer to the teacher question. 
Even after 30 years of it, I was still wondering why I was a teacher. The answer came as I was leaving Hackney for new pastures. I bumped into a woman whom I had once taught at Dalston Mount School for Girls in the 1970s. Then, aged 15, she'd been a wild, vivacious girl who would challenge everyone and everything. She'd been raised in an orphanage and, like me, was an institution junkie. I was supposed to be teaching her personal and social development, which consisted of lessons on how to write a job application letter and present oneself respectably at interviews. Michelle, but that was her name, refused to do the work and insisted instead on discussing race, politics, sex and culture. In fact, all the subjects that Bernard Shaw once claimed to the head teacher of a girls' school were the only ones worthy of discussion. The next time I came across Michelle, she was training to become a teacher. I explained to her that I was leaving Hackney and going abroad for some time. She turned to me and said, Just don't die, Mr Baldwin. At last I knew why I'd been a teacher. Survival Tips for Parents I am writing this on the assumption that you have been persuaded that you have a choice of school for your child and that you are attempting to exercise it. 1. Avoid the head teacher. They are only worried about the roles or, in the case of private schools, their income. They will be unctuous and deceitful. They will treat you like royalty. However, once they have a waiting list of 50 or more, they will treat you like scum. 2. Ignore all Ofsted reports, prospecti, league tables and newspaper articles, police reports and the number of advertised teaching posts are the you should take seriously. Note especially re-advertisements for vacancies at the school This means they are very short of teachers. 3. Ignore all gossip from other parents. The information on which they base their views will be highly selective, biased and usually wrong. They may think little Johnny is doing really well at school. What they don't know is that Johnny is running the drugs racket behind the art room at break and that this accounts for the happy smile on his face when he comes home. 4. Ask the head if you can track a randomly selected pupil all day. If this is allowed, visit the pupil's toilets and eat lunch with them, but not simultaneously. You will end the day in a state of shock, but you will now know what you need to know, which is why the head won't let you do it. So, five, visit the school unannounced, preferably on a Friday afternoon. This is not easy. Schools are like fortresses. They're not much bothered about muggers, drug pushers and vagrants looking for somewhere to kip. No, it's you, the parent, they want to keep out. Tell the receptionist you are delivering a parcel to the schoolkeeper. Nobody dares cross the schoolkeeper. You will be let in. Ask someone where the staff room is. Say you are a supply teacher. You are now where you need to be. It is Friday afternoon at 3.30pm. It is the end of the school day. It is the end of the week. What you see in front of you will convince you that it is the end of the world. 
Half a dozen creatures are ambling about. Others are slumped like jellyfish on the mud at low tide, on black vinyl chairs that were bought in a job lot in the 1970s. The stuffing will be falling out of them. Look closer and you will see faces with sunken, bloodshot eyes and vacant expressions. You will see bodies attempting feebly to move. Some have given up. There will be a nervous spasm from one, a stifled scream from another. A third will burst into tears and stop just as suddenly. Calm yourself. This is not a documentary called After the Somme. These are not the undead. You're not in a third-rate horror film about voodoo. This is the staff room on a Friday afternoon. You have arrived on the other side of the chalk face. These are the people you need to talk to. They are teachers. Select one. Aged about 35 or over, preferably a regular classroom teacher. Even better, pick a supply teacher who's been in the school a while. You do not want anyone with personal ambition. Ask them to the pub. They will be headed there anyway, and they will tell you the truth about the school. Six. If you don't get into the staff room, make sure you see the schoolkeeper. Say he or she has to sign personally for the brown parcel. Invite them to the pub. They will give you an entirely objective view of what goes on in the school. This is because schoolkeepers do not like children or teachers or anybody who works in the school. They make the mess that schoolkeepers have to clear up. There may be a long night ahead, so take plenty of cash. Have someone come and pick you up around 10pm to avoid the worst. 7. Unless you have managed at least one task from 4, 5 or 6, you must assume that you know nothing about the school. If you have succeeded, you have to go through the same process with at least three other schools. Now that you have the hard facts, you may choose a school for your loved one. Good luck. Most of you will be glad that someone still wants to be a teacher, else what would you do with the kids when you're at work? Finally, to those teachers, parents and pupils who are still trying to get a decent, localised, comprehensive system in this country, don't give up. Your country needs you. All the points made in this book relate only to secondary and not to primary schools. Acknowledgements, illustrations by Eleanor Meredith and Michael Baldwin. Thanks to Christina Batty for proofreading and editing. I would like to thank all those people who have knowingly or unknowingly contributed to this book, in particular the staff and pupils of the schools of Hackney, to whom this book is dedicated. Mm -hmm.